we're taught as children in the system that we've come through that we what we have is what we have yeah. and it's a struggle you learn the language of struggle you learn the language of pain you're told how hard it's going to be to be healthy how hard it's going to be to get married and stay married how hard it's going to be in school it's all the language of struggle you're talking about what can't happen and then if you say something like magic oh don't say that you know you don't want to get into that magic you know black magic is that black magic is the ability to go into the darkness and recreate yourself. We're so engorged in the idea of lack. We're so engorged in the idea of that we're passed down to, through us through generation, through habits, um, through our parents, through our teachers, that we sort of take all of this programming and we say to ourselves that this is who I am. We identify with it. And once we identify with it, it becomes who we are. Blessings, people. Welcome back to the channel once again, where we talk all things health and healing from a holistic perspective. And today will be no different. Today, I have an amazing guest with me today. He's not only just a guest, but he's my brother as well, too. My brother in life and my brother in healing as well, too. We're both healers. And let me tell you about Dr. B. Serious, which is a dope name, by the way. <laughs> He's a leading mind, body, and spirit medicine man, certified doctor of metaphysics, master herbalist, natural remedy formulator, wellness educator, vibrational healing music engineer, and pioneer. He's widely respected and endorsed by Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, who is amazing, by the way. You got to connect me to that brother, by the way. <laughs> Dr. Dick Gregory. Alice Coltrane, a host of others, Dr. B. Sirius has clients spanning six continents who trust him with their physical, emotional, mental, and holistic well-being. He's a medicine man, parasite specialist, and much more. Thank you for coming to the show today, brother. It's an honor to be here. Man, and I could have went on and on. <laughs> but I figured we, instead of telling everybody about your amazing story and you know, your your ability to heal will sort of navigate down that plane through the, the interview or the conversation that we'll have today. So welcome to the show, brother. Heal my people. I'm glad to be here. It's a beautiful spot you got here. I appreciate it, brother. So, you know, I always believe that every healer that I met, when I tell them, like, ask them, like, how did this healing journey begin for you, healing other people? Most of them tell me, and the same is true for me, they say, my story began with healing myself. And so tell us about how your journey began for yourself. Well, my journey began as a child when I could, you know, see the world and I was going through states of depression about what what I saw and how I saw people living their lives. And I always had this knowing, this this precognition about things that were about to happen. I could see energies in people. I could hear voices. I always things were in my room. I saw things in the sky. So it started as a child, and to keep myself sane, I got into music and I became a drummer. And I was taught by drummers who were from the continent, who were not into drumming for entertainment. Yeah. They were into drumming for healing. It was about medicine, and it was also about sending messages from village to village. Gotcha. So it was about language. Yeah. So it was a very serious course. Of, of, of learning to take me from where I was in my states of consciousness to another level where I could actually navigate in that world called music. Yeah. And then I got into, later on, I became a record producer, music producer, engineer, studied and did all those things, and became really successful in what they call the music industry. Well, that brought on a whole other sequence of uh, issues Indeed. because of the food that I was choosing, the contracts I was choosing to sign, the friends I was choosing to be with, the whole world of that was just as, just was, it was very challenging for my body and for my mind because where I came from and where I ended up was in a place where it was about, you know, it was about money. Yeah. It was about business. It was about mind control. Yeah. And after becoming really successful in that, I realized that I was being controlled. Yeah. And when I saw, when, when the veil came down, I was like, wow, I'm involved with taking the sheep to slaughter. 
Yeah. I'm involved with this commercial music industry, which is totally opposite from where I came from, which was the spiritual music, you know, creation. Okay. And I got sick. Okay. I actually made myself sick. And uh, the doctors gave me a very short time to live. My, I had an autoimmune system uh, a challenge that all my body, every cell in my body was fighting every cell. They said they'd only seen this a few times okay. and that uh, there was nothing they could do. They said if I had cancer, they could give me five years. This is what they told me. If, we, if you had cancer, we could fry you in the microwave yeah. and give you five years. Yeah. But we, you know, go get your business together. Yeah. When I heard that, that's when the message How, how old were you at this time? I was about uh, 30-ish. Okay. Right around 30-ish. Yeah. And uh, I woke up and I was like, and I asked the doctor, what do you do for a living? He says, well, you know, I practice medicine. I, I said, really, practice? I said, my brother's a mechanic. If he practice on these people's cars, they're going to come get him. I said, give me another term. And he says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, what, describe what you do. And he says, we're into disease maintenance. I says, maintain. You maintain disease? He said, well, you know, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we treat illness. I said, you treat the illness. I said, yeah, I haven't heard me yet. <laughs> you treat the illness? Right. I said, well, what have you cured? Cure? And he says, well, you know, we almost cured polio, but then the president who was funding it died. Yeah. I says, so you haven't cured anything? Then I looked at his jacket and I said, oh, wow, wait a minute. I used to go to the butcher with my grandmother. I said, that's the same jacket that my grandmother's butcher wears. Yeah. Except he puts on a new one. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> the other one, he got his blood on his to let you know. Right. I was like, wow, this is deep. And then I looked at the word doctor and it meant teacher. Yeah. And I wasn't learning anything. Yeah. I was learning about all the problems you know, and all the issues. And I said, something's got to change. Yeah. And I walked out of there and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to change my life. And I got, I walked away from the music business. I walked away from a deal, a $5 million deal. They were offering me a huge deal. And, um, and it was all kinds of deals being offered. I was like the man on the West coast, yeah. you know? Uh, and, um, at that point I said, you know, I can go do that and it's going to take me out because I'm, I'm mentally, physically, and spiritually sick of that industry. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And I need to live. So that's when I began to study natural medicine. Gotcha. And at that time, they had VHS tapes. I studied everybody and everything. Anybody was coming to town with doing lectures, and I had money. So I would fly to go see people doing lectures and workshops and studied everything. I was reading the Bible, yeah. found the herbs and the crystals in the Bibles and the number sequences. Then I started looking at the Quran. I said, wait a minute, these are powerful books. And then the Baca Gavita. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. They're telling us the code is right here right. of how to actually live the best life we could live, but we're missing it. And that's when I changed my entire life. Okay. Within a year, all of my quote unquote, you know, incurable diseases, whatever they were, because I couldn't even pronounce the word, right. they disappeared. Gotcha. My gotcha. life changed, my skin changed, my hair came back, because I was, I was bad. If you saw pictures of me then, you would be like, this is not you. Right, but it was me living that life, living the life for the city. You know, living for the city, like Stevie yep. Wonder says. Yeah, live. People are living for the city. Yep, they're living for their friends, living for their religion and their beliefs, and they're not following the natural path. Yep, the natural path is a path of least resistance. Right, and that path is the path of making yourself better, healing yourself, and becoming the doctor, becoming the teacher. Yeah, you see, yeah. of self, of self. Yeah, for you, and it's yeah. unique. Yeah. When people say, well, this is the way we're supposed to know. There's no we. Yeah. It's me first. Yep. I've got to figure out what works for me. Yeah. Then I can also go help everybody else. Yeah, because at the end of the day, what happens is even when you go into your doctor, they can't even help you if you can't describe to them what's going on with you. They gotta ask you, well, when did this problem start? And how long has it been going on? And sometimes they ask, Well, when does it happen? What times during the day? And uh, you know what did you eat last week? They have to they have to literally source you first yes. before they can even help you, which is probably a good indication that you should probably start with self first too. And I think what happens is a lot of people have given up on the idea of I can heal myself first. Yes. And I think it's because we've disconnected ourselves from the idea that this ease, just like health, begins and ends with us. Yes. And so uh, I love that, man, because like just for myself, I had the same story, like not in the music industry, but I'm working in the hospital and I'm actually unhealthy. I'm overweight by 50 pounds. I had got diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 16. Mm -hmm. 
and this was despite being an athlete, only 7% body fat, 7 to 10% body fat, and uh, get to be in my late 20s working in the hospital. And now when I'm in the hospital with that white coat and my my people see me, they they, they come to me because they're like, I can identify with him. Yes. And what I realized was that our people don't like taking medication. That's right. And so they would always ask me, well, what can I take? You know, what herb can I take and what this can I take? And so, you know, when I was giving them recommendations for the high blood pressure and realized that I had high blood pressure, it made me realize that maybe I should stop being a hip- hypocrite and do something about my own health first. Yes, yes. And that was the beginning of my journey. That was the beginning of the light that said, okay, if I can heal me, then I can guide people along their own personal journey. You know, and so I always love that because most of the time when I talk to healers, that's the experience that they have. Yeah, it's, it's, it's reflecting on yourself. Yep. You know, uh, there's people now that get into this because of the business. I mean, the, the, the natural health industry, the business is like $40 billion or something now. So everybody wants a piece of that. Yeah. I'm saying, I didn't get into this for business. Yeah. I'm still not technically in it for business. Yeah. I give too much away. Yeah. You know, they say, oh, no, this is what you need to do for marketing, and you're not posting enough, and you're not that, and you're not pushing your products. Yeah. I say, you know, I, I made those products for myself. Yeah. All my products I made for myself yeah. and for my mother who had MS. Okay, got you. In fact, one of the first two products I made was for my mother. Yeah. But she was, you know, having the symptoms of MS, but she had a lot of fillings in her teeth. Yeah. It was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And I began to look at it and begin to make products to help her, make yeah. teas and things. And uh, my mother, by the way, was the longest living person with MS that didn't peak. It yeah. got to a plateau, yeah. and then they wanted to cut her open and do experimental surgery. We don't know how this is not, because they, they thought it was going to advance really fast. Yeah. But she was taking her herbs. She was doing the meditations. Plus, my mother was, you know, she was like an oracle. She yeah. just knew. You know, everybody would come to my mother for, you know, if you wanted some spiritual advice, my mother was amazing. Yeah. You know, and she trained me a lot in how to see and how to look at numbers and sequences. And uh, her mind was in a place where the illness didn't stop her. In yeah. fact, she got the teacher of the war of the year for every year for like about, I think, four or five years. As it, She's in the chair. And the other people got their, they got all their, they can walk and they can run. She's in the chair. But she's using herself to project in a, in a whole other way. So a lot of times when we have what we call a deficiency or something that, you know, looks like it's a problem or a handicap, that actually empowers you. Yeah. You see, so I looked at what I didn't have and looked at what I could have. I said, well, since I'm I'm sick, it's tied to its opposite. Indeed. How could I be well? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And I didn't even, you know, I didn't even choose to, to teach. I was just doing this for myself. And what happened was Stevie Wonder had a radio station in L.A. And he had a show in the morning called The Front Page. Gotcha. And this brother, uh, 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 Kyle Nelson, and this other brother named Jamal asked me to come on and tell about my life, how I shifted from the music industry. And, I'm, you know, I had changed because I, you know, I, I reduced like about 90 pounds. Yeah. My whole, everything changed. And they were like, man, you got to tell the story. And I didn't want to do it because I said, I, don't, I stutter. I don't know how to speak. I can't remember nothing. Remember in school, they said I had ADD, ADHD. I was half retarded. I mean, I had it all yeah. as a child because I was out there. I'm looking at the bees, counting the way, how many ways, times their bees, their wings flap. I was on a whole other dimension as a child. So they figured this was a problem. Yeah. But it was interesting that I decided to go on the show and I was nervous. So I just started telling stories. Yeah. And even as a child, I would tell stories and create voices and characters so they wouldn't see the real me. I became a character. And yeah. I did that on the radio and boom, the phone started ringing. Folks started calling me to do lectures because I had a fun way of talking about health. Yeah. And that's the way Dr. B was born. Yeah. And it was like, okay, I, I, I guess I got to do this. And then this one guy says, you have to speak publicly. Otherwise, you're being selfish and stingy. Yeah. He says, and you know, I said, no, I'm shy. He says, shy is another type of stingy. Yeah. You're afraid to show yourself. Yeah. He says, get out there and help the people because you're making it fun and people need that. Yeah. So that's how, you know, this whole thing took that next level. All right, cool. So Dr. B is born. And out of that sort of enlightenment of self-healing, now you're helping other people heal. Yes. And what I found along my journey is that 
You know, I spent four years in Okinawa, Japan, learning from people who live to 100, no disease, and eat primarily a plant-based diet. Traveled to India for a few months to learn about yoga and meditation, and then Africa to learn about herbalism, and then Peru and Honduras, and then finally came back here. And I'll tell you, I've learned the most from the people I've worked with. Yes. Like, the people I've worked with have taught me far more than all of that knowledge that I spent over the course of like six years. But the question like I always have is like, okay, our bodies are designed to like not only heal itself, but also to regenerate itself. Yes. We have detoxification systems that detox our bodies of things that it doesn't need, waste, toxins. We have an immune system that's designed to fight away, you know, foreign bodies and foreign invaders. We have stem cells that can regrow and regenerate our body's tissue. We have angiogenesis, which can feed blood supply to tissues as well, too. We have all of these things in place, and we know that food and toxicity and stress cause disease, but how how is it that our social programming, our consciousness, how is that affecting our ability to heal? Well, what we have is we have blocked channels of elimination. See, if you have a channel of elimination, let's say your toilet black backs up, yeah, it can't flush. Right, you got to call the plumber to clean it out. We're taught as children in the system that we've come through that we what we have is what we have. Yeah, and it's a struggle. You learn the language of struggle. You learn the language of pain. You're told how hard it's going to be to be healthy, how hard it's going to be to get married and stay married, how hard it's going to be in school. It's all the language of struggle. But you're, te- you're, you're taught the language of, of ex-slaves who are now mentally, physically, spiritually enslaved. Yeah. So the language that they're speaking is the language of disempowerment. Yeah. You're talking about what can't happen. And then if you say something like magic, oh, don't say that. You know, you don't want to get into that magic. You know, black magic is that. Black magic is the ability to go into the darkness and recreate yourself. Yeah. Form light. Darkness is where everything comes from, but they scare you of your own power. So everything is about fear. So the average person grew up in a family that lived in fear. They were had inferiority complex, right? And once you have that inferiority complex, you teach it to the children. Okay. Nobody's taught that the, 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 I remember I used to go, have to go outside and pick those dandelions out the grass. They had a special little tool. Yeah. My father said, go out there and get rid of those dandelions. Little did I know that these dandelions, because every once in a while I take one and eat it. Yeah. Something just said, eat it. My father said, you're not, you're eating those things? Well, they're good. I like them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> then we find out that dandelion is so important to help regenerate the blood, help the kidneys, the liver, and the spleen. Yeah. This is medicine. Yeah. But why do we get it out of the lawn? Because they had a law that they created that said that anything other than grass could not be in your front yard. It's called the Beautification Act of America. Because mm. people had whole farms. You're, you wanted a lot of land, yeah. not to cut that sucker with a lawnmower, yeah. to grow stuff, right. to take care of your stuff. But no, we need you to go to the grocery store now. And, and keep in mind, the grocery store doesn't have anything growing. Yeah. And in your mind, you keep saying it's a grocery store and there's nothing growing. Right. You go to the pharmacy and there's no farm. But you, you know, your mind has been programmed by lack, limitation, and not enoughness in a slave mindset. You don't, you're not able to put it all together here. Right. There's nothing in here healthy. Right. So the bottom line is we were taught to lack to, to, to limit ourselves from our natural healing. We were taught to be afraid of getting into our natural self because that's paganism. Herbalism is paganism. Right. You got crystals and you got you got stones and things and you into these numbers. That's pagan. Right. You got to go to the church. To get your healing. And you got to wait till you die to go to heaven. Right. But the book, I'm reading the book, it don't say that. Where y'all, where, where, where is this in the book at? Right. I thought it said something about creating heaven on earth. I thought it said something about you can do more than I. Right. Once you realize that you've got to reach this divine state inside you. And once you read that, they call it in, in, in Sanskrit, the city. You have to reach this divine state, right? Where you are existing. Right. By creating your outcomes in your mind first, first in your mind, then feel it like it's already happened. Right. 
Feel like you are creating heaven on earth. Feel your body healing. Feel your organs regenerating. Right. I've had people who have healed just from thought. Right. I said, just focus on your leg, your knee, being better. Right. They did an experiment years ago where they had people who had knee, needed knee surgery. They took one group, cut the knee open. First, they showed them all the video of the operation. They took one group, cut the knee open, right? And then sewed the tendons back together, whatever. One group, they cut the knee open, sprayed water, put them back together. One group cut the knee open, didn't do anything, and put them back together. The people all thought they had the same same operation. All right. They found out that the people they didn't do anything to healed just as quickly as the people who had all the sewing and cutting and sawing and drilling. All right. What is that about? Your mind, right, is creating the healing. When you're able to tap into the darkness, when you're able to tap, in, tap into that space, you tell your genes what to do. They're genies. That's the genie story. Right. The magic carpet is the genes. Yeah. The bottle is your body. Yeah. You rub the body. That's through exercise, meditation, ex whatever it is. You're rubbing the body. The top pops off of that bottle. Boop. And a vapor comes out. That vapor is what? The divine essence. That's the mystery. That's the, this, the stuff that you can't explain. It's ineffable. Right. And then the genes pop up and say, what would you like? And you tell your genes every second of every day what to do. That's the gene, genie. Yeah. But the genius is the genie too. The genius is that there's a genius in every cell waiting to awaken. There's a genie in every cell waiting to awaken. Yeah. And I think what's really important for people to understand is that the same way if you were depressed, you can make yourself sick, you can also do the opposite. Yes. You can, you can create a mind state. In a mentality of healing as well, too. And quite often what happens with people is that we're so engorged in the idea of lack. We're so engorged in the idea of that were passed down through us through generation, through habits, um, through our parents, through our teachers, that we sort of take all of this programming and we say to ourselves that this is who I am. We identify with it. Yes. And once we identify with it, it becomes who we are. But we don't know that it's just like computer programming. Yes. With a computer, you got the hard drive. Yes. But it doesn't function at, at, at all if you don't have any programs to put on a computer. Yes. So if you got a Microsoft program that is outdated, that is not in alignment with what you want in life, then you have to essentially switch out the programming. Yeah. And I think that's so important for people to realize on this journey of healing is that you know, this biology of belief, how we can shift and change, you know, not only in our physical bodies, but we also can shift and change the environment around us as well, too. We just have to have the courage to be able to do so. And as you were speaking about the, the genes, I think what's really important for people to understand about genes, because that was the idea I had when I got diagnosed with high blood pressure at the age of 16. I had all my grandparents die by the time I was 15. So when they died, and they died of all these diabetes, colorectal cancer, heart disease, et cetera, in my mind, I chalked it up to, I, it has to be bad genes. I'm an athlete. I only have about 7 to 10% body fat. It has to be bad genes. But I think it's important for people to realize that genes are like light switches. They can be turned on, and they can be turned off. And what happens is quite often, Quite often, our inner environment is what turns the genes for disease on. Yes. And, and I always say to myself, when I look back at what was going on with me between the ages of 12 and 15, everything said, you should, you should essentially turn on death. Yes. Because by the time I was 12, I, had, I watched another friend murder another friend. Mm -hmm. I had another friend kill two people in a robbery. I had a, a cousin and best friend get m killed and murdered running away from the police. And this is about a time between ages 12 and 15. And I lost all my grandparents. Now, nobody really talks about what, what do you do with a child. And I ended up in the same case and scenario. They ended up putting me in the quote unquote retarded class. Yeah. And the only thing that saved me, and this is really important for people to understand on the journey of healing, the only thing that saved me was the first day I was in the class, I'm in the eighth grade, I had always been an A-B student. The first day, the teacher 
tells us to open up the book, and she says, if Johnny had five seashells and Sally had four and Sally gave Johnny two, how many seashells? I'm like, this is simple addition. What are we doing this for in eighth grade? What changed everything was I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. And me raising my hand repeatedly saying I'm in the wrong class and finally telling myself, like, I'm going to the office. You don't have to send me. That's changed everything in my life because I knew where I didn't belong. And I think what's really important for people is to know what thoughts don't belong in your life, what beliefs don't belong in your life, and what thoughts and beliefs aren't aligned with you not only healing, but aren't aligned with you getting the abundance that you would deserve in life as well, too. It's interesting because they sent me to the special class and they gave us clay to play with. Mm. And I came home and my mother said, what'd you do today in school? And I pulled out my little wax paper and it had clay. She said, what is this? I said, this is what we did in school. She says, what, what class was this? I said, they put me in the class 302. Everybody knew 302 was the special children. Gotcha. She said, oh, no, no, no. She said, we're going to school early tomorrow. She marched down into the school and she went in with the, and she used to talk very clear and very soft. Yeah. Whatever she said to them. The next day, they was moving me up a grade. Yeah, they put me back, and then all of a sudden, I'm something special, you know. And now, I'm, and I'm too special. And the thing was, I remember going to algebra, algebra pre-algebra. This would switched it off for me. Yeah, and I'm sitting there, and the teacher says, "Welcome to the class. You're here to to begin pre-algebra." And I said, "Whoa!" He says, "This is pre-algebra." He said, "Yes." I said, "This is not algebra." He said, "No." I says, "Well, I'm leaving." And I get up and I walk, and I said, "Where are you going?" I says. I'm going to come back when y'all doing algebra. This is pre-algebra. And I said, what is this pre-thing? Then later on, I begin to realize that, you know, there's people in my family that have pre-diabetes, pre-heart disease, pre... What is the pre? That We're not there yet. Yeah. You think you have it, so you begin to create it in your mind because you figure you're aligned for it because it runs in your family. Right. What's running in your family is your ideas, your beliefs, your food, your habit. And you connected him through love so much that it must be, I got to die like they die because I love them. Yep. You see what I'm saying? And a lot of us don't even realize what love really is. Love sometimes is being an apostate and going outside the circle. Yeah. You know, And you become an apostle. You walk a different path yeah. than everybody else. And you can come back and attempt to teach them. And a lot of them don't want to hear from you anyway because it's crazy. Yeah. My doctor told me that I, this is you know, my doctor. That's your doctor? Your doctor does not come to visit you. With, you know, when, when, when you have a, when, at the funeral, none of the doctors in my family came. Yeah. We didn't even get no flowers. Yeah. I said, what happened to the doctor? That was her doctor. You see? And, and I'm not against doctors because I have friends who are doctors. Some of my top clients are doctors and nurses. They love my products and what I'm teaching. But they are in a situation where their oath is not the oath that they originally took. Their oath now is to some other corporations I don't want to mention. They have to do certain things because that's the programming yeah. to get people to be to live sick, to people to be corralled like sheep in a farm. Yeah. But when we wake up, and it happens different in everybody, you got to stay awake because everybody around you is going to try to bring you down. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, people in language and what we speak and what we believe and all of those things have a lot to do with it. You got to be ready to break the spell. Yeah. I broke the spell on everything. I'm not doing it. I don't like it. You know what I'm saying? My father said, well, you're never going to make it in music. It's never going to this. I became the first and the number one black young record producer on the West Coast of America. Hip hop in Southern California was started by me. Mm. Hip hop, the whole thing in Southern California, that was me. Yeah. This was before the NWAs and all that. But I didn't tell the story. Nobody really knew. I just told it on my show, uh, uh, Serious Vibes with Dr. B. We told it for the first time. That everything I got into, whatever I did was impossible. Yeah. Everything I've done is impossible. Even what I'm doing with herbs, people say it's impossible. And let me tell you something real quick. Uh, herbs don't do anything. Prayer don't do anything. Meditation don't do anything. Yoga don't do anything. None of these things, they, they have potential. Yeah. What does something is you moving towards them, agreeing with them that they have power and potential. So your car can't do anything without you putting the key in and then knowing how to drive. Yeah. So if people ask me, say, well, Dr. B, do these herbs work? I say, nope, they don't work because you're already in doubt. So don't even buy my stuff. I don't even need you to come back to me that it didn't work because you've already programmed yourself to say it doesn't work. Now, if you meet the thing halfway, what was that thing they said in, in, in church? If you meet God halfway, if you take one step closer to God, God takes 10 steps closer to you. 
This is what I'm saying. When you already know that you're about to take some sarsaparilla for your blood, you need iron because this is the biggest issue. And you got a wonderful iron product. I'm glad I got one too. I may have copied you. I don't know. <laughs> Tell you the honest truth. But without iron, you can't do nothing. You're going to be soft. Your emotions are going to be caught up in other people's stuff because you're not firm enough. Right. You don't have enough of the lion in you to create the courage in your cells. Your cells don't have enough voltage right. to do anything. Yeah. So when you are reaching towards, let's say, sarsaparilla or something that has a lot of iron, you have to already know. This has got a lot of iron in it. The minute you grab it, this is how deep it is. The minute you choose it, do you know it starts working? Yeah. Your cells begin to open up and say, we've already taken it. Because everything is everything. Everything is energy, right? Yeah. It starts with your energy, your inner God. Yeah. Knowing that when I go to see Dr. Price, I'm going to be helped. Uh, when I go to his place, when I take his product, if I watch his lecture, I'm already there. Yeah. And a lot of it doesn't have to be what you take, it's what you make, what you create. We're very creative people. Yeah. We're co-creators. And once we get that, then we got it. Now you're not relying on me to be the healer forever and come to me for healing. I'm not, I can't heal you. Yeah. I'm working on myself. I got my own stuff. I'm on a, I'm breathing the same air y'all breathing. And I don't care how holistic you think you are. You breathing that air? Indeed. You touching doorknobs? Let me tell you something. You are challenged here. But what I realize is that our issues... Are, are these are our opponents. These are worthy opponents. Yeah. Your problem, right, is like your sparring partner testing you to see if you're going to become a master. The things that happen to you that you think are happening to you are happening with you, from you, and for you. Right. To test you. Yeah. So dis-ease, Dick Gregory, you know, one of my greatest teachers, he says, disease is a teacher. It's going to teach you how to live or how to die. You have to make the choice and let that be your opponent. And everything is tied to this opposite. So change the frequency. Yeah. And I always tell people, like, from my, my philosophy on dis-ease, which I believe is this is like the removal of, yes. and then ease is peace. So it's the removal of peace yes. from your body. And what removes peace from the body is often, you know, toxicity. And now toxicity isn't just heavy metals and you know, trash food, but toxicity is also thoughts and beliefs as well, too. So disease is the process of removing toxicity and either the or either the result of deficiency in the body. Yes. And so I think it's really important for people to know from a standpoint of, you know, like our our perspective on disease is that it is these collection of symptoms. Yes. And when the symptoms are gone, I'm healed. But that's modern medicine. Modern medicine is designed to turn off the symptoms. Yes. But it's just like a car. If you turn off the check engine light, it doesn't mean you don't need an oil change anymore. That's right. You still need an oil change. And as a matter of fact, if you run the car long enough, you're not only going to find out that you need an oil change, but the car is going to break down and not, no longer function anymore. And so like, let's get into, again, I, I really want, I want our people to really understand like what the process of healing this first, because when you think about our mind, ninety five percent of the activity that is happening in our minds is subconscious activity. Yes, it's below the level of consciousness, yes. and we believe that we're making all these conscious thoughts and actions, and you know, um, we're living our lives in such a way where we're really in control of it. But the most the vast majority of what we're going through is subconscious programming. And so give us some tips on what we can do to start to shift this subconscious programming because it's not only the programming that we received, you know, here right now when we're watching TV and we see the commercial for the hamburger or, you know, we see the commercial for the pharmaceutical drug that they're telling you to go ask your doctor about. But it's also the subconscious programming that we got as children. It's such subconscious programming that we got for our, from our mother in her womb in whatever state she was during the pregnancy. But it's also that subconscious programming that is hand, handed down and passed down throughout generations. So how do we give us some tips on how we can navigate shifting our subconscious mind so that a lot of the actions that are taking place, they can start to shift uh, in our lives, not only in our minds, but in our lives as well, too. 
The subconscious mind is the habit mind. It's the body mind. It is working to run the systems that need to be run automatically. So breathing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, when it's time for your heart rate to go up because you're running. It's all subconscious programmings that are actually keeping you in a state of being here. Yeah. The subconscious is programmed by the repetition of pleasure or pain. Yeah. It's the repeated issue the repeated activity that programs the subconscious and all the subconscious is is a librarian it takes the issue whatever has happened the experience and it puts it in a file cabinet yeah. if the issue if the thing we're going through is highly charged then it's going to put it at the top of the file cabinet up front and when you say highly charged you mean charged by emotions emotions okay so it could be you're really happy and you're really joyful. It's going to put that up at the top of the file cabinet and up front so that it can be grabbed at any time. Yeah. Anything that is in the environment that is reminiscent of that vibration, it's going to grab it and say, okay, we're in joy. Okay. We're, in, we're at this place. It's wonderful. Automatically. Without, Automatically. Even if, even if this isn't is an experience that actually requires joy, you will experience joy. You experiment. Okay. You, you will see. You could see a color. There was a color that you saw when you experienced this joy, or a smell in the air. Yeah. Boom! That turns the file on. The subconscious opens up and says, "You feel." It. And all of a sudden, you start smiling. Like mama's cooking. Mama's cooking. Yeah. All those things are subconscious, and smells are the oldest memories. Yeah. Smells. Now, if the experience is disagreeable then guess what? That's highly charged because you're emotional. So it goes to the top of the file cabinet too and says, this is really important. Yeah. Now there's a lot of other file cabinets and files in this, in this cabinet, you see? But the ones that are highly charged are at the top, okay. readily available. What triggers them is an environment, an idea, a sound, words, or energy that is reminiscent of the state that you were in when whatever happened. This programming, you at this age, let's say something happened at five. So let's say you're 30. You figure out what's happening right at five and you say, oh God, I got to change that programming. So you go down to the file cabinet, to the librarian and say, I need to change that program. But that file has a, uh, a guard. You're trying to get into your file and the guard says, what's the, what's the code to get in? Right. You say, I'm me, I'm in charge. I says, no, I don't know you. Because you don't have the voice and the energy of the five-year-old. Yeah. You're not the five-year-old anymore. And you, at five years old, was the captain of the ship, the head of the CEO, and said, don't ever let nobody in here. Right. This is what I'm feeling. I own this. Unless I come back, you don't let me in. So there's a guardian, a fail-safe, or a combination of everything happening in the subconscious. And that's the resistance to changing your subconscious programming. The resistance. But there's a back door. If you begin to do something that is different, like, okay, so here's a big one. I figured my father, he was mean to me because he wanted me to be a doctor or be a draftsman or an engineer like him. Yeah. I didn't want to do none of it. I, w I was like a black militant. I was all into, we from Africa and we from this. And he would always say, well, how do you know you're from Africa? How come you couldn't be from right here? It's so it's more pyramids in America than it is. And I'm like, he's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But he did a lot of things to test me. He was my sparring partner. So I thought he was treating me mean. Yeah. It wasn't until I got older, I was like, oh, wait a minute. He was training me. Yeah. He was teaching me. So what I had to do was that when I started creating what's called a language syntax, because when we study subconscious alignment, you have to create these word statements that you can drop into the file cabinet to begin to change the original programming. So instead of my father treated me mean, I had to get the program to realize that my father, right? Yeah. My father treated me in a way to help me become who I am. Somebody came to me once and they said, well, my father, you know, he, was, he wasn't there, he wasn't this, he wasn't that. Well, they went and met the father. And the story that they heard about the father was from the mother. And it was all terrible. Till the sister went and met her father. 
who was actually paid for her college degree, paid for their house, paid for her first car. She didn't know where this stuff came from. Yeah. He was helping from a distance. She didn't know that. It changed the program. So sometimes when you say, even if a person is treating you disagreeably, that person is helping me become who I am yeah. by challenging me. Because a master always, what, gravitates towards being tested. Yeah. The more stuff you've been through, the more drama you've been through, it's because you're becoming a master. You don't hear about the master kung fu artist not fighting anymore because he beat everybody up. Yeah. He wants to go now and test himself with somebody that everybody says is the greatest of the great. You have to keep testing yourself. A lot of people don't realize that we're here testing ourselves. And the opposition is you. Your opposition is you. Your things that's showing up is actually you. The programming can be changed through repetition. So the more times I can feel, say, see, and hear, because you got to take it into a cave. It's got to be kinesthetic, auditory, and visual. Kinesthetic, I got to feel as if my father was helping me. I got to hear it. I got to hear his voice. I got to change the words. Yeah. And then I've got to see in my mind, because a lot of times we talk about seeing. Seeing can be tricked. Yeah. We've been, our eyes been getting photoshopped ever since cartoons, Santa Claus, and everything. Okay. We got to feel it. If you can feel that something has happened, that's how you begin to obtain it. So I tell clients, I say, feel as if you're in the state of health that you'd like to be. Yeah. Feel it. Can you, what would you like to be doing? Well, I'd like to be on the beach. Well, let's go there. Yeah. Feel it. Sit here for a while. And people are fighting. You see them shifting and everything because somebody's, something keeps telling them, no, I'm sick. They said, I'm going to die. And this is what the doctor said. And I said, no, let's go into your dream time meditation yeah. and create based on feeling. So if you can feel as if the state that you would like to create is happening now, and you do that every day. The most important time is before you go to sleep. Gotcha. Over and over and over, as you're laying there about to go to sleep, you're going into the theta state, yep. in between sleeping and wake. What you're doing is you're seeding your subconscious with new seeds of a new idea. Yeah. Because just before you go to sleep, all the talk you got in your head, think about what people are saying before they go to sleep. Right. What they didn't do. Who didn't like me. I'm mad about this. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And then they ate a bunch of stuff before they went to sleep too, which is also clouding their memory because it takes 80 to 90% of your circulation to go to the stomach to try to digest this stuff. And a lot of it is not digestible because it's Franken food. It was man-made. It didn't even exist 30 years ago. Gotcha. All this stuff is going on. So it's a war going on. Yeah. So you got this in your head. So you are not control of your dream time. So when you become in control and you have a, a statement that you're creating over and over, you're seeing it and you're feeling it, and that begins to seed the subconscious, which is like a fertile earth, and you start growing a forest, right? And you do it every single day, every single night, and all of a sudden your life begins to change. Because yeah. your cells, which are part of the subconscious, because the subconscious is also called the body-mind, it's all in your body. Your subconscious is not in your head. Yeah. It's not big enough. The hard drive has got to be huge. That's your body. It's not even your. It's not just your body. It's also your magnetosphere. The energy, energy all around you is a part of you. Yeah, and that's why I always tell people, like people who struggle with performance or changing their mind state, you got to get out of your mind and get into your body. And I used to tell you know, being an athlete, I used to tell athletes that I would mentor this all the time. It's so important to get in your body because you got to think. You take an athlete like LeBron, who people say because he didn't go to college, there's no way he can be smart, right? But you take an athlete like that who's dribbling full speed down the court, hits a crossover, spins, fakes a pass to the left, goes up left, and then goes up right. All of these actions happen in a span of two to three seconds. Now, if you were to be in a, in a span of two to three seconds thinking that whole time, it would be very difficult to complete all of those moves at once. Yes. But most of those things, if you ask some of the great athletes, you ask them, did you know that you were going to do that? They had no idea. They weren't thinking at the time. And I think what's really important that you're tapping into is that there's a part of the brain called the RAS or the reticular activating yes. system. It's our filtering system in our brains. Yes. It's that same symptom, system that whenever you say, man, I want... A red car. A red car. All of a sudden, you start seeing red cars all the time. That's that confirmation. That's that affirmation that's telling you that if you have the, the courage to set the intention, then the environment or 
the universe is saying, then I have the courage to meet you halfway. Yeah. And let, um, before we get out of here, let's tell people about the event you have coming up with Billy Carson, the Blueprint for God Power. Well, Billy Carson, first of all, is a powerful person. He's showing us how to live at that next level. And he has information that's far beyond anything I've ever heard about who we are. Yeah. And uh, he's an amazing guy, and he's teaching people how to become wealthy. He, he has techniques and things that he uses to help, you know, to, revive, to revibrate. I like that word, to revibrate your mindset. Yeah. So we came together to do this thing called God power. And the God power is something we all have. It's the power at the root level, right, that we have to co-create, yeah. you see? And to tap into that is when you now become, you know, you become Christ-like. Christ means crystallized imagination. You can now create a new world. Yeah. So we, we did this event uh, called Blueprint for God Power, and we did it in January, and it became the biggest event ever done of its kind. It was 10 hours of us, us giving you actual things that you could do each day. That will change your life. The people that have done it be, have changed their mental, physical, emotional, financial life like crazy. Yeah. So now, you know, we've, we're doing God, the blueprint for God power two. People like, we need part two. Yeah. So we're dropping all these nuggets of how to get down to the hard drive, how to reprogram yourself, how to live in love, how to create the cave, kinesthetic auditory visual experience, how to go into that dark place where you exist. Right. And pull the genius out and then take yourself to this place, place where you can re-realize your life. And these are not things that are just talk. These are actual things. So where I'm giving people exercises, subconscious alignment exercises that you do every day. There's eye movements and things that you can do that reprogram you every day. There's uh, movements that you can do with your body. There's sacred geometry you can look at. There's all of these things that we're going to be offering in this blueprint for God power too. And that is, is, is guaranteed if you do it and you repeat it every day that your life will change. The yeah. only thing that's going to keep you from changing is the negative, disagreeable you. Yeah. You see, that disagreeable you is going to challenge you. And what, so you got to realize that that disagreeable person being within you is there to challenge you and help push you higher. Yeah. And, um, and so if people can't make the event, they can go to your page to get to the event, right? Yes, they can. All right, and so we'll get into that in just a second. But if they can't make the event, will they be able to go see the event uh, either online or afterwards? It will be replays. It'll okay, be, gotcha. You know, at our website, we'll have a replay. In fact, Blueprint for God Power 1 is on our website. Okay, good. And then we'll have Blueprint for God Power 2. And when we do the three, they'll all be there so anybody can tap into it at any time and do it at your own pace. Gotcha, gotcha. And tell the people where... They can stay connected with you and uh, all that good stuff. Uh, elevationtime.com. Elevationtime.com is our website. And uh, I'm also on uh, IG and Facebook, Dr. D-O-C-T-A-H. Dr. B. Serious. Serious like the star. Okay. Like, or like the, the satellite. Yeah. Dr. B. Serious on IG, on Facebook, and uh, at elevationtime.com. We got classes workshops and make sure you get on the newsletter because I'm always sending out blast about what we're going to do. And I'm going to be sending out a blast sooner about this event that Dr. Bobby Price and I are going to be doing together. Gotcha, gotcha. See how I'm placing that out there? <laughs> we're going to, you know, we've been talking about getting together and coming yeah, together. Yeah, we have. It's been so busy that we have to do this now. Gotcha, brother. Because we, you know, we have so much to share and uh, this is the time for sharing. This is the time for we. Yeah. This ain't the time for me and I. Yeah. You know, let's come together and create the best life available. And we do it as a community, as a people, and oneness. It's not about your color. It ain't about your religion. It ain't about none of that. That's old school. Yeah. We're going through a mutation right now where the original gene set, the original mindset is coming back online where we are co-creators. But we've got to be ready to let go of the past and come together and share and have love. Stop talking and gossiping about other people and what you think they're doing. It's none of your business. Right. Mind your business and business your mind and focus on elevating your life. Yes. And other people will follow once they see that you've changed. Yeah. Be the change. Don't look for the change. Don't wait for the change. Become it and become it now. There's no time like now. I appreciate you, brother. This has been a powerful conversation. I know the people are going to experience it the same way we have today as well too so i want to thank everybody for showing up for heal my people tv this has been an amazing episode with dr 
Be serious. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. Bless.